From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. and New York studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lines. President Biden says there will be more sanctions against Russia following the death of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. This as a key city in Ukraine falls to Russia. Former U.S. Ambassador to Ukraine John Herbst will be with us. Nikki Haley says she's staying in the race for the Republican presidential nomination as a pair of new polls show her down more than 20 points against Donald Trump in her home state. We'll speak with Cliff Young of Ipsos. And a major merger in the credit card world has some lawmakers calling for regulators to look closely at the deal. Kaylee, I know that was part of the conversation, at least today in Washington with lawmakers out of town. We still heard from Senator Elizabeth Warren and Sherrod Brown, for that matter, on the banking merger. But we're looking forward to a very challenging calendar here and not a, pro a lot of progress getting done from these lawmakers who have now left you alone in the Capitol. Yeah, it's lonely here in D.C., and not just because you're not here today, Joe, but it, it is true that we won't probably see many signs of progress until the very end of the month of February, if not right at the beginning of March, when they are facing a deadline to avoid a government shutdown, but also to deal with the issue of Ukraine aid, especially in light of, as you mentioned, the death of Alexei Navalny just days ago. And now the U.S. is promising there will be a response to that. President Biden spoke earlier today. I told you we'd be announcing sanctions on Russia. We'll have a major package announced on Friday. Coming on Friday. Joining us now to talk about this and our other top stories, Bloomberg's Dan Flatley and Nancy Cook. Dan, I want to start with you on this because we've seen so many rounds of sanctions since the beginning of the war in Ukraine. A couple of years worth of conversation. We keep hearing that we have... We have put the most historic sanctions in history on Russia that we've done all we can. So what else is there to do? Well, there's um, a lot that's left to be done in terms of enforcement of the sanctions on energy, potentially on metals, uh, on some of the other um, commodities that Russia uses to raise money for its uh, war in Ukraine. Um, but it's, it's hard to come up with an easy answer off the top of, of your head as to what is left out there that would be an obvious target. Uh, the focus has really turned in the last six months to a year on, on sort of ratcheting down uh, on some of the sanctions that have already been rolled out. So in terms of new targets, um, there's a few things that could potentially be out there, but I think uh, the U.S. has really hit a lot of the uh, major targets that, that are available at this point. So we'll wait and see what the president indeed does announce come Friday. Meantime, we've also heard from the president on the issue of additional aid to Ukraine, uh, especially in light of the death of Alexei Navalny. He says he hopes that that actually could rally support for the emergency funding package for both Ukraine and Israel. Take a listen to him over the weekend. They're making a big mistake not responding. Look. The way they're walking away from the threat of Russia, the way they're walking away from NATO, the way they're walking away from meeting our obligations, is, is, is just shocking. I've been for a while. I've never seen anything like this. And the president also said over the weekend, Dan, that if Mike Johnson, the House Speaker, has something to say, maybe he would meet with him as the Speaker has been calling for. Is that what has to happen next for there to be progress? Yeah, I think, you know, there needs to be a sit down between the Speaker of the House, Mike Johnson, and, the, and, the, and President Biden in order to, you know, at least stake out their negotiating positions. Right now, they're not talking. And that's not a good thing if your goal is to get something passed by the end of the day. Um, the Senate has acted. So now it's sort of on the House. But the battle lines have hardened. Um, the House is going hard after Alejandro Mayorkas in terms of the uh, impeachment of, on the DHS secretary. Um, they're, they're driving hard at the border. And so it's, it's not going to get any easier at this point. We heard uh, from Republican Congressman Brian Fitzpatrick on the sidelines of an event in Kyiv earlier today. Dan, let's hear what he said, and we'll have you respond. We're going to get something through Congress. The, the problem is you have, a, you have a lot of people that don't want to compromise. We have a compromise bill in the House, Democrats and Republicans unified together, that we're going to demand a vote, get it to the Senate, and get this done. 
But then you introduce reality, Dan, called the calendar here, and it's unclear how any of this can get done, never mind fund the government before we're talking about shutdown in March. Yeah, I mean, that's always a question with, with Congress is uh, the funding deadlines and, and, and time that's left in, in terms of trying to get things done while you still have an opportunity to do them. Um, in some ways, a little bit of time pressure might help uh, the situation because it might get people motivated, but it certainly isn't going to make things any easier, and it's going to mean a lot of long hours for folks on Capitol Hill and, and anyone who's trying to figure out uh, what they're doing up there. So um, it's going to be interesting a uh, few weeks ahead. Interesting indeed. Bloomberg's Dan Flatley, thank you so much. Meantime, just four days are left until the Republican primary in South Carolina. And Nikki Haley is trailing former President Trump by almost 30 points in the latest USA Today Suffolk University poll. Suffolk University Political Research Center director David Paleologo spoke with us earlier today about Haley's chances. It doesn't look good at all. I mean, this is just awful for her in her home state, two-term former governor of South Carolina, you know, worse than Iowa for her, worse than New Hampshire. And uh, if these, if this margin holds up. Let's bring in Bloomberg's Nancy Cook, who covers national politics for us and will be heading to South Carolina herself pretty soon. It seems pretty abundantly clear that Nikki Haley is not going to be able to win the South Carolina primary. Where are she and her campaign setting the bar, though? How low is it? <laughs> well, as she has said, she came out today and said that she did plan to continue to mm -hmm. compete after South Carolina. They are pointing to a number of states in early March that will vote, and they feel like, you know, they want to make the case that uh, they still have a chance there. I think that, honestly, realistically, what we're looking at is that she's setting herself up for two outcomes. One is that there's some sort of health scare or legal trouble that ensnares Trump to the point where he can't end up being the nominee, and she will be the last Republican standing in this primary and therefore will take up the mantle at the last minute. The other thing is that uh, I think she's definitely looking towards 2028 mm -hmm. and setting herself up for a presidential run there. She's in her early 50s. She's young. You know, she's been a governor. She's been the uh, U.S. ambassador to the U.N. She has a lot of great political experience. And I think, uh, you know, even if she does not become the Republican nominee this time around, we will continue to hear from her. Nancy, it's good to see you. We saw Nikki Haley deliver what she called a state of the race speech today in Greenville. Never good when you hear that we're doing a state of the race speech. Never good when you have to tell people at the beginning of it uh, that you're staying in the race. And that is what she did. Here's Nikki Haley from earlier. Some of you, perhaps a few of you in the media, came here today to see if I'm dropping out of the race. Well, I'm not. Kind of says a lot about where you are in your campaign when that when that becomes the headline. Nancy, we're hearing uh, from Donald Trump's senior campaign advisor, uh, Chris La Savita, who says they're going to have this in the bag in terms of delegates, uh, at least by March 19th, maybe my, by March 12th. If, if all of this happens and, and following your logic that she's kind of staying in this just in case, what happens to the Nikki Haley campaign in the spring and summer? Do they keep raising money? Do they go on ice for a while? How do you do that? Well, if the Trump campaign's predictions are correct, that they can sort of earn enough delegates to really lock up the nomination by late March, then I imagine Nikki Haley at that, that point will have to drop out. You know, she has been successful at raising money. She has really surpassed people's expectations in terms of being the last Republican to challenge Trump. She has, um, you know, did great in debate performances. But I think that things will become much clearer after that March 19th date that the um, Trump campaign keeps citing, just because the delegate math will become impossible. And, and her campaign people are quite smart as well. And I'm sure that they will understand that. You know, you always want to project confidence, uh, even if, you know, behind the scenes, the math becomes difficult. Yeah, it's funny how the rhetoric can change overnight. Our thanks to Bloomberg's Nancy Cook. Good to see you, Nancy. Coming up, Cliff Young of Ipsos Polling will be with us as we dig into the contours of this campaign. That's next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Nikki Haley is behind former President Trump by more than 20 points in two new polls released today for South Carolina. That primary is just four days away. Ms. Haley says she's staying in the race. Both Trump and President Biden, meanwhile, are preparing for a rematch of the 2020 contest. So is there a path forward for Haley or is this all really general election politics right now? On that note, let's go to Cliff Young of Ipsos, who is joining me here in our Washington, D.C. studio. So, Cliff, obviously Nikki Haley is still trying to act like there is something of a contest. Much of the electorate, though, doesn't really think that there is one and, frankly, don't really like that that may be the outcome, that it's going to be Biden versus Trump. And yet that's where they are. Is there an issue, something that could catalyze someone like Nikki Haley, an alternative that would change that? I think it's really difficult. I mean, obviously, anything could happen. An asteroid could hit the Earth. (laughs) Things could (laughs) change, right? But really, uh, the numbers are baked. Um, Trump is leading by a lot in South Carolina and really uh, across the United States in general. I think it's a done deal. It's a foregone conclusion that we're going to have Biden and Trump in the generals. So with that said, Cliff, this is Joe in New York, and it's good to see you. I appreciate your being on with us. What should our listeners and viewers be looking at when it comes to polling right now? Because we're seeing remarkable continuity, even in, in, a, in a small sample in South Carolina, where polls seem to be indicating the same thing, yet we're told frequently not to pay attention to national polls because there's so much noise at this stage of the game. There's so much confusion over the sample. What's your take? Yeah, you have to look at both. You have to look at the nationals. On the one hand, they say something, they're atmospherics, they give you a temperature of the country. You have to look specifically at at states, especially in in a system where uh, the swing states are so important with the electoral college system. But what what I would say to viewers is that really pay attention to issues right now. Don't look at the ballot question, the matchup at this point. Mm -hmm. We're really far out, and they tend to be not very accurate at this point. Mm -hmm. And really look at what are those issues that Americans are worried about. So what are those issues right now? It feels like up until in the last several months, we were saying it's economy full stop, number one, always. And yet the border, as we saw evidenced in Iowa and New Hampshire in these early uh, Republican primary contests, was possibly even topping the economy. Are you seeing that reflected in in your data? We're seeing a a changing issue set. So it was the economy. It still is the economy. People are worried about that. People are having problems making ends meet, but that's changing. Things are getting more positive. And without a doubt, immigration, the border, is a key issue. Crime is another one. Mm. Uh, Saving democracy is a third. And we're not quite sure which one will come to the fore and be most important for Americans um, this electoral season. I'm glad you mentioned that because I was really struck. uh, I think I can speak for Kaylee as well. When we were in Iowa and New Hampshire to watch immigration step in front of the economy, and in some cases by a long shot when it came to voter priorities in those two states, the caucus and in the primary, Cliff, we saw research from Goldman Sachs that was on Bloomberg today that finds the president's, Joe Biden's economy, might be right around the dividing line. By the time we vote in November, the line that separates winning re-election campaigns from losing ones based on history. It's almost like this is going to come down to who scores last in a long basketball game. Do you feel that way? Yeah, this is basically, you know, March Madness, right? But uh, (laughs) it's an entire electoral system. Yeah, I see it the same way that we're going to really go up to the end. Um, The last sort of inch or the few inches will be an election of inches. Mm -hmm. Uh, The economy is going to be very important. Um, But the immigration and immigration issue, the border, um, really gins up the Republican base, will be very important for mobilizing them. Um, If it's not the the issue, it will be an important secondary issue. Mm -hmm. So once again, it's going to be a close one. Um, The economy will be important, but these other issues like like, uh, immigration will be as well. Let's talk about the issue, though, of just the age of these candidates. This is something Nikki Haley has been talking a lot about, the idea that, yes, President Biden is 81, but Trump is only four years younger than him at 77. And you've actually done some polling that shows 59 percent of Americans think they both are too old to serve second terms. But it feels 
like Cliff, that we mostly just talk about the age question when it comes to the incumbent president, not the former one as much. Yeah, 59 percent, a majority believe that both are too old, uh, but something like 27 percent of the rest believe uh, that Biden's too old and only 3 percent believe that Trump is too old. So you have, on average, more Americans believing that Biden's too old. Um, in other polling, what we find is Trump is seen as more energetic uh, um, it, there's more vitality there, um, is not seen as sort of old a, as Biden. Um, whether that's an issue that really weighs in the end, uh, because obviously voters use a variety of factors to decide on who they're going to vote for, um, we will see. But definitely Biden is in a position, in a weaker position, relative to Trump at this point. So voters appreciate honesty, at least we're told, Cliff. Does Joe Biden embrace the age issue? They can't have him running up and down the stairs. That's obviously not going to work. If he keeps people laughing about it, if he keeps acknowledging it, does it help him? Uh, I don't know if it helps him, but it doesn't hurt him. And, and what he wants to do is distract a bit. It's a very difficult um, uh, issue to have stuck to you. Um, obviously, as you age, you can't really go backwards, right? Yeah. Uh, and it is an anchor for him it, it, or an Achilles heel. Um, once again, there are many other factors that are com will come into play, like an anti-Trump vote, which is very strong. Um, Anti-Trump vote might Trump actually age, uh, but it's something that uh, Biden will have to contend with, and there's no easy answer. Well, on the subject of the anti-Trump vote, also on what you referenced uh, a few minutes ago, the idea that American democracy being at stake is, is an issue that uh, is starting to really show up in the minds of voters, we could be very well dealing with, just a few months from now, a Republican nominee who is a convicted felon in the United States as his New York uh, criminal trial will begin on March 25th. How could that change the game here? First, we don't know. Uh, yeah, that, that's course. the first thing. We, we really don't know. Um, some of our initial polling suggests that it would hurt him on the margin, so it would, it would shave off a point or two uh, here and there. But we, we're really not quite, really sure about it. Ultimately, um, our polling on, on, be, on, on basically indictment has suggested um, that he can weather through it. Uh, so, you know, net of everything, I think he probably has hurt a bit, uh, but not completely taken out. Is there a difference between conviction and sentencing or polling at Bloomberg would suggest that actual prison sentences might make people feel differently. Yeah, I think there's qualitative differences between being indicted, being convicted, and then going to jail. Yeah. Um, once again, how much that weighs against him, uh, we will see. He will definitely, that is, Trump will definitely frame that as being, being politically motivated and, and really being unfair. Mm -hmm. um, but we, this is a wild card we have this electoral season that we're really unsure about its specific effect. Just think of how much we have to learn together, Cliff Young. He joins us from Ipsos. It's great to see you back on the program. Thank you, Cliff. Coming up, a credit card mega merger. We've got more on the tie-up here between Capital One and Discover next on Balance of Power, Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Capital One has agreed to buy Discover Financial in a $35 billion all-stock stock deal to create the largest U.S. credit card company by loan volume. But Democratic Senator Elizabeth Warren of Massachusetts, not a fan. She wrote on X today, quote, The merger of Capital One and Discover threatens our financial stability, reduces competition, and would increase fees and credit costs for American families. This Wall Street deal is dangerous and will harm working people. Regulators must block it immediately. Joining us now to discuss whether or not that's going to happen is Jennifer Ree, an antitrust analyst over at Bloomberg Intelligence. So, Jennifer, you think this thing gets blocked or does it get through? Well, I'll say this. It certainly isn't going to get blocked immediately because there is a process, right? And the Department of Justice is going to have to investigate it first, and that's going to probably take up to a year at least before they decide what they're going to do. But, you know, I honestly, Kaylee, ultimately think there's something that's really pro-competitive about this deal. You know, as much as there's a knee-jerk reaction, you've got these two great big banks coming together, 
you know, right now, the whole bent of this of this agent of this administration is to stop this kind of consolidation. But at the end of the day, you have had fights over antitrust with Visa and MasterCard for years and years. One of the very first cases I worked on as an antitrust attorney was a Department of Justice lawsuit against those two companies for trying to block out Discover and American Express from the market. Um, and I think what this deal does is it provides a more compelling competitor in card processing to Visa and MasterCard, which really essentially have a duopoly. And that's a pretty strong pro-competitive benefit to the deal. So while there may be some concerns on the card issuing side, um, I think when you have such a strong pro-competitive benefit and you need to weigh that against the potential risks, that's going to weigh pretty strong in favor of this deal. You mentioned DOJ, uh, Jen. How about a legislative answer to this? You've obviously got uh, Elizabeth Warren champing at the bit here. So, too, the chair of the Banking Committee in the Senate, Sherrod Brown, out with a statement referring to a merger this size, the need for regulators to ensure our financial system remains strong and competitive. Should we start bracing for the hearings? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I think that that might happen. Um, you know, right now, ever since President Biden issued the executive order in July of 2022 that was really encouraging many of the agencies in the United States to, to amp up competition, to revitalize enforcement, and in particular to stop consolidation. There's really been this strong push by many in politics to just stop these kinds of deals. And there is a bit of a thought that it's just a big deal and we need to stop big mm -hmm. deals. But the thing is, and certainly they can hold hearings on that and they can grill the CEOs all they want. But at the end of the day, we have antitrust laws that govern how these deals are reviewed and what kinds of theories of harm are going to resonate with a judge. And it's not just the fact that it's a big deal that causes a deal that, that means a deal violates antitrust laws. It has to harm competition and that potential harm to competition has to outweigh any of the pro-competitive pro -competitive benefits that the deal might also bring. And that's something a judge has to decide. Mm -hmm. So co Congress can do what it wants to and it can yell and scream. It can have its hearings. But that's not really going to have all that. In my mind, it won't have that much impact on what ultimately happens here with the Department of Justice. And if they actually sue to block the deal, what happens when a judge assesses it? And Jennifer, we only have about 30 seconds left with you, but whether this goes through or it doesn't, do you think that's going to be a tell on the extent to which m a in fi the financial industry is going to be tolerated? You know, I don't think so. I think this is a different kind of deal. This is a more vertical deal mm -hmm. than it is horizontal, although it has both aspects. It's not about retail banking branches, which was what we usually see when banks come together and merge and they have to divest a number of branches. This is a different situation. It has strong pro-competitive efficiencies that not all deals do. So I don't really think it's mm -hmm. a good example other deals. This is why we call Jennifer Ree when we get news like this. Great to see you, Jennifer, from Bloomberg Intelligence. We appreciate the insights. Coming up, we'll be joined by John Herbst, the former U.S. ambassador to Ukraine and Uzbekistan. Talk about the fall of the Ukrainian city of Avdivka. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. The situation will be very difficult when you don't have the ammunition you need uh, on the front lines. You're going to be vulnerable, and that's what we saw over the weekend with the loss of Adivka and uh, or Adivka. And so, I think it's the facts on the ground that will continue to make the case to members of Congress why they need to act, and we hope they will. That was Matthew Miller speaking for the Department of State. As we turn now to John Herbst, the former ambassador to Ukraine and Uzbekistan is with us now. He's also senior director of the Eurasia Center at the Atlantic Council. Mr. Ambassador, it's great to see you. We wanted to have a conversation about funding in Ukraine when we arranged this conversation. And since then, to Matthew Miller's point, we've seen the fall of Avdivka in Ukraine, a significant battlefield victory for Russia. And the president of the United States, Joe Biden, uh, is, is blaming lawmakers' failure to provide funding for Ukraine. This has been going on for months now, this debate over Ukrainian funding in the Congress. Is he right to connect those dots? There's no question that the failure to provide aid, which is now a five-month failure, this should have been approved when proposed in September, has led Ukraine to deal with a shortage of ammunition. 
And I, I think it's highly likely that if Ukraine had been armed properly, if that aid package had been approved several months ago, mm -hmm. they would have had more than enough ammunition to hold Avdiivka. Well, it, it raises the question for me, Ambassador, that when, as President Biden has done on multiple occasions, he has said the U.S. will be there for Ukraine for as long as this conflict goes on, a promise that he may not necessarily be able to keep because it relies on Congress also keeping that progress. Should the U.S. have prepared Ukraine more for the possible scenario that aid would stop? Well, would, they, would Ukraine be conducting itself differently? I think that there's a... This is not a reason to criticize the administration. But the administration has made two very serious mistakes that have contributed to the situation. The first is that they should have made the aid package proposal not in September of last year, but in March or April. Mm. And I know that there were especially many Republicans in Congress who were wondering why the administration dawdled. And the second mistake has been a characteristic of the administrations since even before the Russian big invasion, which is the administration has been timid and slow in providing Ukraine the weapons to produce a more effective impact on the battlefield. The limits of Ukraine's gains on land with the counteroffensive is a direct result of the administration's refusal to provide F-16s, the longer range attackums, which they even to this day have yet to provide, although they're now talking about it, Abrams tanks and quantities, and other, other measures. And this is because the administration has been partly intimidated by Moscow's nuclear threats, which is not good politics, not good geopolitics. Ambassador, our viewers and listeners expected the fall of Avdivka because Melinda Herring told us this would happen. The senior fellow at the Atlantic Council joined us last week and shared her concern over what was happening there. Here's what she said. The city that everyone's watching that's in ruins, that the Russians are likely to take by the end of the month, is Adivka. And, and that will be one more city uh, in eastern Ukraine that, where there's absolutely nothing left. Uh, but then the line will, 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 will continue to, to uh, ebb away. Ambassador, you were just cataloging some of the mistakes that you see in your view that this administration has been made. Help us prevent the next one. What can Joe Biden do to move the needle on Ukrainian funding? Uh, this, is, this is a hard one, and you can't blame this on the administration. Uh, this is a problem produced by a small faction within the Republican Congress who don't understand that America has a critical interest in stopping Putin in Ukraine that Putin is our foe. He's identified us as Russia's main adversary, and they are doing everything they can to undermine American interests. And the place to make Putin pay for this is in Ukraine, because Ukraine is fighting for its existence as an independent nation. And all we need to do is arm and uh, Ukraine properly and provide them economic assistance. And the aid which we are providing Ukraine represents approximately 4% of our defense budget. And with this, the Ukrainians have been able to stop the Russians. So uh, if the Republicans who are holding this up let the aid package pass, one, there'll be no for further defeats for Ukraine on land. And two, if then the Biden administration sends them more advanced weapons, we'll see Ukraine begin to take back more of this country and kick the Russians out, which is very much in our interests. Well, Ambassador, you speak of a few Republicans who are more opposed to the notion of continuing to provide support to Ukraine. You could argue that that comes from the very top of the Republican Party right now, the man who very likely will be the Republican nominee, the former president, Donald Trump. And, of course, he just in recent weeks have suggested that if NATO countries do not pay enough, he would encourage Russia to do whatever the hell it wants with them. You are joining us from Poland. I know you were in Munich as well at the security conference in recent days. How much concern do you sense on the part of our European allies about the prospect of another Trump administration? Well, it is great concern, first and foremost, about the state package, but secondly, about the possibility that if Trump wins, uh, American support for NATO may diminish substantially and American support for Ukraine may also diminish substantially. Uh, I understand those concerns. I don't know if they reflect what would happen in a second Trump administration. There's no question 
that the statement Trump made about NATO was not responsible, that it undermines our interests. It's also true he said similar things as a candidate in 2015 and 16 and as president of the United States. But it's also true that his administration, uh, despite those statements, despite the way Trump behaved with Putin at the 2018 Helsinki summit, took some strong measures against Russia that the Obama administration refused to take, like sending javelins, anti-tank weapons. Uh, so it's possible that a second Trump administration might include some irresponsible statements and without the policy going in the wrong direction. I'm not predicting that's the outcome, but I see that as one of, one of two possibilities. Ambassador, uh, you also served as Consul General in Jerusalem in your long career in the U.S. Foreign Service. And I have to ask you while you're with us about what's happening there is the United States has drafted a ceasefire resolution that goes before the U.N. Security Council. Should it pass? Uh, we will see. What, what, what we're seeing right now is a very common phenomenon in the Middle East. Things like that happen uh, when I was working on the Middle East, both from Tel Aviv and from Jerusalem, mm -hmm. uh, back in the 60s before I, before I joined. Um, Israel is understandably responding to the savage attack that Hamas launched. And we've seen things like this in the past. Um, then the Arab world you know, up gets angry and they push for Israel to stop. And the United States, while supporting Israel, feels that pressure. And then we counsel restraint on Israel. Sometimes Israel listens, sometimes it doesn't. And even as we counsel restraint, we protect Israel in the in the UN. And we did that recently with the uh, proposal by Algeria for a ceasefire resolution, which failed as we opposed it. Uh, but then eventually some sort of understanding is reached between Washington and, and Jerusalem. And uh, Israel exercises some restraint. But so the U.S. resolution is obviously something we support, something which Israel is still bridling against. Um, but if we push hard, there's a good chance that Israel will go along and that the Arabs will also go along. But this is a work in progress and there are other possibilities. All right, Ambassador, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We appreciate your time. That's John Herbst, former U.S. Ambassador to My Ukraine pleasure. and Uzbekistan. Now coming up, President Joe Biden says he's willing to meet with House Speaker Mike Johnson to discuss future funding for Ukraine and for Israel as well. We'll be joined by our political panel with the latest on that next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. President Biden told reporters over the weekend that he would be, quote, happy to meet with House Speaker Mike Johnson to discuss an emergency funding package for Ukraine and Israel. Of course, the speaker wants to talk about the border as well. Joining us now, our political panel, Sarah Chamberlain, Republican Main Street Partnership President and CEO, and Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. So, Sarah, just to begin with you, because we always know you have your pulse on everything happening within the Republican conference. Even if that meeting between the president and the speaker were to happen, could it actually result in Ukraine aid being passed, knowing that that potentially could threaten his gavel? Probably not. I, d I don't see that happening. And frankly, I have to say, they should have met weeks ago. Mm. He has been the speaker for a long time. The president should have invited him over immediately. Um, but I don't think Ukraine, there's a lot of issues going on with Ukraine, and that's an inner party problem that's going to have to be resolved without, uh, without the President Biden's input. Well, Sarah, Jeannie, we talked to Tom Emmer last week, the majority whip about the possibility of a continuing resolution to fund the government. This is the other issue that no one seems to be talking about right now, whether we're going to have a government shutdown. What is it? We're, gosh, less than two weeks away now. They're only going to have three days left when they return, and here's what he told us. You're not going to get another uh, continuing resolution out of our conference in, in Congress. Uh, the last one was, uh, was difficult, and that was done because our speaker uh, recognized that there just wasn't enough physical time to process all the bills once the, uh, the House and the Senate had agreed on the top line numbers. So uh, this time you're going to have to get these things passed. 
So where's the gut check on this one then, Sarah Chamberlain? Because it doesn't feel like we have the time now either. And he used the word minibus, which is a swear word to some <laughs> members of the Freedom Caucus. How does this end? Uh, it does not end in government shutdown. I'm going to predict that again wow, uh, today. Right. But it could be a short-term CR. We, c we do not. We cannot get these three. In three days, we can't get all this passed. I mean, it's impossible. We haven't been able to get it passed in months. Um, but we will have some type of continuing resolution or, or many. Something's going to happen to keep the government open. Nobody in the Republican Main Street Partnership wants to shut down the government. Because if you do, the fear is when do you open it back up and how do you get it open back up? So it will keep going forward. And, and they will not recall the speaker. So the speaker gets a little bit of extra movement around this. Nobody is going to recall the speaker after the disaster of what happened last year. Really? There was no plan B. Nobody, Jeannie? You believe that? <laughs> not even, say, Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has threatened to on multiple occasions? You know, I don't know what to believe about Marjorie Taylor Greene. I would hope they learned their lesson and they do not yeah. recall the speaker. Um, you know, the, the danger is the rule allows for one person to make that move, as we all lived through. And so, you know, the reality is a government shutdown hurts everybody. It hurts Republicans. It hurts Democrats. It hurts the economy. It hurts all of us. It should be averted. I think the really scary part is the fact that they went away for two weeks, yeah. coming back with 72 hours to go. The idea that you could do these bills in that time, you can't. So they're going to have to have some kind of CR, laddered or otherwise, <laughs> they're going to have to move in that direction. And so we all have to hope they're able to make that happen when they come back. And of course, they're working on it now while some of them are away, some of them are here getting these bills so that they're in a position to put forward a CR when they come back and quickly move forward. But I think, you know, you look from a 30,000 foot level, this is no way to run a government going forward we have to be budgeting for the year not living <laughs> under CRs it is you know a disaster for all of us well so Jeannie isn't this an opportunity for Joe Biden to have the speaker come to the Oval Office not like last time not all the leaders just Mike Johnson come sit down one-on-one -on -one. we can hammer out this deal to keep the government functioning and maybe come up with an arrangement on Ukraine when they both step out to the stakeout microphones how's that sound Joe, that sounds right. You've got to be pushing for this. Move it forward. I am all in favor of people talking. But I do have to say, and I never say this, I am empathetic to the administration's problem here because the reality is Mike Johnson wanted to have border security. They added it to the supplemental. He ran away from it. And so now, how do you negotiate in good faith with somebody who you can't trust on these issues? So do I think they should be talking? Yes, but I am empathetic to what the administration is saying when they say, how do we have a compromise, a negotiation, even a discussion with somebody who would back away from something as important as a security bill? And so that is, I think, a challenge. And Mike Johnson needs to do something to assure them that they can converse openly and that they can move forward in this way before they meet. So we'll see if Mike Johnson indeed speaks with the current president, Sarah. But we know he speaks often with the former mm -hmm. president. In fact, he was in Florida visiting Trump That's at Mar-a-Lago over the weekend. Sure we is. have a thumbs up picture for mm -hmm. those of you listening on radio. You can find that uh, on X. Is Mike Johnson really in charge of this House of Representatives or is Donald Trump through Mike Johnson? No, it's a combination. I mean, certainly he would go and meet with a former president who is also going to be the Republican nominee. That would make sense. But but the speaker is in control. And on the border, there, there were a couple issues in that bill that the House uh, members didn't care for. Even the Republican Main Street Partnership members didn't care for. Um, so I think you may see it coming back around and may be able to get a little bit compromised. But the speaker is in charge. He's had good days. He's had some rough days. Indeed. But, but he is learning. I mean, he came out of nowhere to be the speaker. He doesn't have any experience. Well, that's important what you just said, Sarah. Just quickly, what would be the item to change in that bill that would make it more palatable, not for every member of the conference, but for your Main Street partnership? So there's two items right off the bat. The one thing is the D.C. courts. You shouldn't be bringing them up here. This is a very liberal court. It's one of the most liberal in the country. So that would go out. And also, they want to lower the numbers that can come across. It is still a huge number. They want to make that much smaller. And so there is some room for an open compromise on that. Fascinating. Coming up, Nikki Haley is vowing to stay in the Republican presidential race, regardless of how things turn out in her home state of South Carolina. 
this weekend. We'll play it to the panel next. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Of course, many of the same politicians who now publicly embrace Trump privately dread him. They know what a disaster he's been and will continue to be for our party. They're just too afraid to say it out loud. Well, I'm not afraid to say the hard truths out loud. I feel no need to kiss the ring. I have no fear of Trump's retribution. Republican presidential candidate Nikki Haley earlier today in what she was uh, billing as a state of the race speech. And it follows some pretty tough polling coming out of South Carolina, her home state. Of course, her home state holding its primary election this coming weekend. And joining us now, our political panel, Sarah Chamberlain, Republican Main Street Partnership President and CEO, alongside Jeannie Shanzano, political science professor at Iona University. Uh, these numbers are tough, Sarah Chamberlain. Donald Trump in the latest uh, USA Today Suffolk University poll. Donald Trump leads Nikki Haley by close to two to one. Uh, this is an undeniable lead, and it's it's been shown in other polling that we've seen in South Carolina. So it appears to be a big win, another big win for Donald Trump. What will that feel like? A lot of folks have questioned the level of embarrassment that might follow Nikki Haley losing that badly in her home state. What will that feel like on Monday if it happens? Well, I think she will be embarrassed. I think for all intents and purposes, Donald Trump is the nominee. I think Nikki Haley is staying in there for a couple of reasons. First one is name ID. No matter what happens in four years, we're going to have an open presidency. So, you know, Trump cannot run again. She has 100 percent name ID. She is she could be the logical choice. The other reason is I think she's watching his criminal. If if one of these courts actually prosecute him, they find him guilty. He becomes a felon. She's the only other person that has electoral college votes. So I think she's also playing that, that game. Mm -hmm. So she's going to be in this for a while. She's playing the long game. Well, Sarah, as you bring up the many court cases the, the former president is facing, we know that comes with big legal bills as a result. He spent millions of dollars on them so far, and we're kind of just getting started when it comes to the criminal cases. So maybe that's why it's time to get into the sneaker game. Self-branded <laughs> $399 metallic gold high-top sneakers. Take a listen to Trump announcing these this weekend. <laughs> I've wanted to do this for a long time. I think it's going to be a big success. Your influences have been very positive. They've been real influences, and they love it, and they love what we've done. That's the real deal. That's the real deal. <laughs> so, Jeannie, I know you kind of want a pair of these sneakers, but as President Biden in January pulled in $42 million, he's sitting on a chest of $130 million at this point. Do you got to do things like sell sneakers to try to keep up for a general? You do if you owe over $400 million, apparently, in legal fees and fines. Um, you know, the best part of that was you hear them booing because sneakerheads found these very objectionable. They didn't <laughs> like them. Um, they were too reminiscent of Nike and Jordan, the first iterations. Um, but President Biden has been a fundraising juggernaut. I mean, the money they have raised, and I would stress 97% of that, for $200 or less donations. Those are big numbers in small number donations or small dollar donations, rather. That is very good. And they got a million dollars a day after Trump won Iowa, mm. which tells you in, in those first three days, which tells us something very important, which is that people on the big fundraisers on the Democratic side, they want to stop Trump. They do see him as the nominee, as, as Sarah just said, and for all intents and purposes. And that's why that big money is going to Biden. And he's out in the Man. West Coast getting more as we speak. Indeed. Hey, Sarah, everybody's a fashion critic around here, but you and I both know those sneakers are all going to sell out at $399 a pair, aren't they? They are. I can't wait to get mine. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that for <laughs> It's only a pre-order right, so far, All right, and on that Katie. note, okay, well, 
in case anyone wants the sneakers, get your pre-orders <laughs> in now in case Joe's prediction comes through. we got to leave it there. But Jeannie Shanzano and Sarah Chamberlain, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. And check out the Washington Edition newsletter for more coverage, not just of sneakers, but all things 2024 and geopolitics <laughs> as well. You can get that on the terminal and online. i got nothing on the sneakers, Kaylee. Thank you for joining us on Balance of Power. <laughs> this is Bloomberg. We'll see you back here tomorrow.